Hi, 7th grade. Welcome back. Uh, today is Tuesday. I'm actually making this video on Monday. Uh, so some of you have not taken the exit ticket yet. Please make sure to take it. Uh, the first question, uh, we're going to go over the exit ticket first. The first question says, what is the name of this church? So this church is Santa Maria del Fiore. It's located in France. It was created during the late medieval period, but the dome itself was created uh, during the Renaissance by Brunelleschi. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, which of the following is a Corinthian style capital? Remember, Corinthians uh, have like these little. Uh, it's more. It has more of a design to it. This is Corinthian. This is Ionic, and this is Doric. You will need to be able to identify the different styles. Okay. Well, from what civilization did the uh, people of the Renaissance get inspiration from? And that is, most of you guys got this question wrong. Uh, question right, I'm sorry. From the Greeks and the Romans. Uh, true or false? Arches, domes, and Roman columns are typical aspects of Renaissance architecture. The answer is true. Right? Uh, Roman architecture tends to use uh, a lot of columns, a lot of domes, and a lot of arches, rounded arches. What did Brunelleschi spend most of his time uh, designing? And that is, he spent most of his time designing this building. You have to know the name of this building. Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence. Um, the next one, which of the following is a classical influence on Roman architecture? That means, wh which of these comes from the classical period? The, the, the Greeks of the Romans did not use flying buttresses, so that's incorrect. Flying buttresses, again, are these, um, I'll show you an example in a second. They did not use, uh, ro um, flying buttresses. Where was I? Uh, they use the dome. So people in the Renaissance borrowed the dome from the, from the, um, from the Romans. They did not have pointed arches or gargoyles. I'm not sure why you would pick gargoyles. People of the medieval ages referred to their architecture as Gothic. The answer is false. Right? Gothic is a negative term given to the architect architecture by the people of the Renaissance. If you if you were living during the Middle Ages, you did not say, "Oh, there's a Gothic building." You wouldn't have said that. That's a term given to Gothic architecture by the people of the Renaissance to, to be degrading, to be an insult. Okay. Fine buttresses, pointed arches, and heavy use of stained glass uh, was mostly low, um, found in Gothic architecture. Okay. Renaissance architecture did not have flying buttresses. And neither the classical. Select all that apply for the following image. So this image. Select all that apply. So this image is from the Renaissance period. It is called St. Peter's Basilica, 1500s. It uses Roman columns. I misspelled columns, I apologize. It has a dome in the back. It does not have flying buttresses. Um, which of the following is a pantheon? A lot, of, uh, a lot of students got this one wrong. Which of the following is a pantheon? Oh no, a lot of students got this. Oh, let me look. Yeah, a lot of students got this one question wrong. The Pantheon. The Pantheon is that structure that has a big dome. It's A, this one. The Pantheon was created in ancient Rome. Uh, it has a huge dome at the very top, and then it has these columns. You guys see these columns? Which is something that they borrow from the Greeks. This is the Parthenon, which is in Greece. I know the problem is that they sound very similar. Pantheon, Parthenon. This is ancient Greece, 500 BC. This is the Pantheon um, about 2,000 years ago, okay? Uh, I think it was finished in the 100s. This is St. Peter's Basilica, 1500s, okay? And then uh, a lot of students got this question wrong as well, the last one. From Quizlet, screencast and articles uh, linked. What is, some of the, um, what is the name of the following cathedral? This is Notre Dame in Paris, okay? Let me show you guys what it looks like. So this is uh, Paris, if you go to Google Earth. Notre Dame is this one. It's a Gothic church. So these these are the flying buttresses. You see these little ribs. That's what the flying buttress is. There is no dome here. Here's the pointed arches. Uh, a, lot of stain, a lot of stained glass. The bottom, the middle, and the very top. Um, and then you see a big hole at the very top. 
So, so the whole roof pretty much burned down uh, about two years ago, and you see, um, you see like a like a crane there trying to figure out what's going on. But this is Saint Peter. This is not Saint Peter. This is um, this is Notre Dame in Florence, not Florence, Paris. I'm all over the place, in Paris. Okay, so that's that. Um, we're gonna go over a number of things today. This video will be. Probably as long as the one you did yesterday. So today we're looking at sculpture. So does that does that mean that we are going to not focus on architecture? No, we're going. You're still going to have some questions on architecture and and on the exit ticket, but we're also going to begin looking at sculpture. Now, you'll see that some of these images I whited out to be more modest. Um, I did that myself. Uh, when we see the video, they don't do that. So. You know, if, if that bothers you, I apologize. There's nothing I can do about that. But the videos are educational. Uh, and you are in seventh grade. I hope that you guys understand this. Okay, so they, I've, I've, I've wired them out. So that's that. So we're going to start with classical sculpture. So sculpture has to do with, um, with statues, right? Uh, the big thing about classical sculpture is the, the, the thing that's the most obvious is that there's nudes nudes right um that means that they don't have any clothes they valued human beauty they value human beauty right their um their their statues are pretty uh, accurate in terms of proportions in terms of the human body in terms of the human body okay so I th I believe this is a this is a Greek one from ancient Greece. Um, I don't know if this is Roman. I think this is Roman, but I'm not 100 percent sure. You'll see that they're very similar because the Romans were influenced by the ancient Greeks. Okay, so the first the, the telltale sign of um, classical uh, sculpture is that you see a lot of nudes. You also see movements. Does that mean that the statues move? No, but it looks like as if they're moving. Right, uh, it, this statue is pretty accurate. You can even see the ribs here. Right, he's in the act of throwing. You can see the veins here. Okay, you can see the some of the muscles here. You see the muscles here. Okay, so it's very accurately, a uh, very accurately portraying humans. It even has the, you can even see the hair. Okay, so this is a Greek statue. This I believe is a Roman statue, and again, a lot of them are nudes. There's some that are not nudes, but a lot of them are nudes. And when I say nude, that means that they don't have any clothes on. Okay? So that's that's the big one for, for ancient Greece. Here's another one. A lot of their statues were of gods. Like Zeus, Poseidon. This is Zeus right here. I think that's I think it's Zeus with an S or a Z. Uh, and here you see that he is in the action of throwing throwing uh something. Um Again, there's a sense of movements. There's not a lot of sense of emotion in their statues, but there is a, a number of things that you'll see that the people in the Middle Ages don't do. There's a sense of movements. It is anatomically pretty correct. This looks like a person. Now, it looks like a person that's been working out. So it's a stylized, um, stylized uh, image. It's kind of like what you see in a magazine, right? Real people don't look like that. Only pretty people look like that, right? Most people don't look like these statues. Pretty people look like these statues. People that work out, people that are constantly in the gym, right? So it's very stylized. It's 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 an example of what human beauty is. So you, that's what you see in these here, um, like the apex of humanity. Okay. So this is uh, classical, um, classical. Uh, sculpture, and you'll see that people of the Renaissance are impacted by this. Here's another one. This is um, the emperor. Um, this is the emperor of, of ancient Rome. Here he's pointing to, uh, I don't know what he's pointing to. Maybe he's Thanos. Who knows? Um, you see the drapery here, right? Um, also stylized. This guy actually probably didn't look this strong. But uh, he's he's supposed to be like a living in Rome. He was considered like a god. He's he's given like the attributes of a god, and this is supposed to be Rome. 
So again, very stylized. Stylized in the sense of where people are seen as, as the best. Um, okay, let's move on. Now, this is, I'm gonna, this is classical going up. And let's see some of the things that you notice in the medieval period. So let's see if you notice these things. So you, here are the images of these. And then here we get the medieval period. So I'll give you a second to think about how are these different? How are these different? Not that one. How are these different to these? Okay. If you didn't notice already is that these are wearing clothing. They're wearing clothing, right? They are not, not self standing. Not self standing. There's a word that I need, want you guys to review. There's my vocabulary. I had it here. Here it is. They're not self standing. And there is no real sense of like anatomy here. Anatomy is a study of human body. If you have a good understanding of anatomy, that means that you have a good understanding of the, the human body, of how the human body looks. So I'm going to write anatomy. Question mark. Uh, did people really put into e put an effort into describing the human body the way it, it should look? And the answer is probably not. Not because they didn't want to or they didn't know. Maybe they didn't know. But the point of uh, medieval sculpture is not the sculpture itself. It is the message. It is the message. So the point of medieval sculpture is the message that it is sending. Either of a king or, or Jesus or the Virgin Mary. That um, it, it is the message to the viewer. Here is to celebrate hu uh, to celebrate emperors, obviously celebrate human beauty, celebrate human beauty. Here, it is to celebrate religion, right? It, 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 it's not relevant that it is not realistic or that it is not uh, anatomically correct, but uh, the message is that there's a king or there's God. Okay. Um, the biggest difference you'll see here is that these guys. Or, or girls are not are in relief. That means that they are not freestanding. So in relief means they are not freestanding. This guy is freestanding. That means that he's not attached to a wall. This guy is at freestanding, 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 and freestanding. Freestanding means that they can stand on their own. Yes, they're standing on something, obviously, but these guys are attached to a wall. Okay, these are in relief. That's the key term in relief. Okay, so this is medieval. Big things about medieval is um, they're clo they have clothes on. They are not freestanding, so they are in relief. There is no real sense of emotion still. That's still lacking. Um, and most of the, the sculptures are going to be religious. And then we get to the Renaissance. Now, we're going to spend some time going over general ideas of sculpture. Uh, of the Renaissance, and we're going to spend several days next week focusing primarily on Michelangelo and Leonardo. But today I'm going to give you a preview of um, of, of Michelangelo's uh, sculptures. We're only going to look at Michelangelo's. So this image is known as Michelangelo's Michelangelo's David. And it took him several years to develop. Um, Michelangelo, if you remember, Michelangelo was a very religious person. Not that you remember that. Um, many of his works are religious, including this one. Right? So here he goes, blending religion and classical influences. If you look at Michelangelo's David, this one, he looks like one of these ancient statues, okay? But Michelangelo's David is also a religious piece. Um, he, he uh, the David comes out of the Bible, the Old Testament. He is a prophet in the Old, Old Testament. 
Um, and here, Michelangelo makes him seem almost like a like a god, right? Anatomically correct. Again, very stylized, meaning that most people don't look like this. This is the epitome of what a human being would look like. And Michelangelo and Da Vinci actually studied human um, human anatomy, human bodies, to understand what the human body looked like underneath the skin. So that he's able to very clearly even provide ribs. Look at this muscle. Right? He's able to create a human being from uh, a block of marble that looks like a person. Right? This is... A, a statue that looks like a human being. Uh, he is really, really, really large. Um, he's like ten over ten feet, um, ten feet uh, in in size. So this is Michelangelo's David. So this is the whole statue itself. Uh, again, this is a combination of classical ideas. It looks like a Greek god or a Roman god but it is uh, influenced by the Renaissance and the medieval period because he comes from the Bible, okay? And again, we're going to spend time working on Michelangelo next week. This is known as the Pieta. By the way, this one does show emotion. He has that sense of like, um, like very serious, ready for battle. Uh, this is known as the Pieta. This is the Virgin Mary and the dead Christ. Um... Again, he took several years doing this. You're able to see what a dead person uh, laying on, on the lap of, of someone might look like, right? How their body kind of falls in, into, into, into the other person. You can even see the, the drapery. Okay. You can even see the drapery. Sorry, you can see the drapery. Uh, you can see some of the emotion of the Virgin Mary. So this is called the Pieta by Michelangelo as well. On that one, you could also see um, like the human body and how his body is like going limp, right? It's very, it's under, it, it's very clear that he has a solid understanding of what a human being looks like. Here is Moses. Michelang another Michelangelo, right? This one, because it's up close, you're able to really see the detail. Here are his veins. This one, you can also see his veins, especially on his feet and even his hand right there. Okay? So this is Moses, another. So this is religious, and this one is also religious. This one is Moses in the Old Testament. Moses led the Jews out of Egypt, part of the Red Sea, according to the Old Testament. Um, yeah, this is the Moses. We're going to be focusing more on, on this one next week. This is Donatello's, I believe it's by Donatello, Donatello's David. This one, this one was created before, before this one. This one was created first. Um, here you'll see, it's also a freestanding you see that this is freestanding, this is not standing at all, this is sitting, and this is freestanding. So another thing that you notice about Renaissance sculpture, a lot of it is freestanding. This is not freestanding. This is medieval, and this is freestanding, okay? Um, this one was also, this is also uh, another freestanding and a nude. So one thing that you notice in the Renaissance is that the statues, the sculptures also, a lot of them have nudes. This is a nude. Again, because they are heavily impacted by the classical period. One interesting thing is that people of the Renaissance created white statues uh, out of white marble because they believe that that's how the Greeks and the Romans have done them. But the Greeks and the Romans actually painted their statues, uh, the, these white ones. But over time, they became white. The color fades. But that's okay. Okay. Um... If you look at some of the statues that have, people have developed over time, you'll see, uh, let's find one for George Washington.
George Washington has probably has a statue somewhere. Uh, here he is. So people are still impacted by this. This is George Was this is George Washington's statue. I don't know if George Washington walked around with a sword without a shirt. And then we have um, we have obviously this these uh, these these other ones, uh, Lincoln. Lincoln Memorial. I misspelled Lincoln, I believe. No. Statue. So here's Abraham Lincoln sitting. Also, so this idea of the of the white statue has kind of stuck with us, you know. So now I'm going to show you guys a short video. Um, so this this I can obviously censor it because you know it's just a video. I can't do that. So I'm going to show you. Um, you know the the comparison between uh, medi uh classical medieval and renaissance on your exit ticket you will be required to identify some of the works that we talked about today and identify why is it medieval renaissance or um or classical i'm gonna stop this once in a while Throughout history in the West, there's this tension, this conflict between naturalism and abstraction, and it goes back and forth. So what we wanted to do in this video is trace some of that tension. We're going to begin by looking at an ancient Roman copy of a Greek sculpture. So we're going back to the period of classical antiquity, the period when ancient Greece and then ancient Rome dominated the Mediterranean and dominated European culture. This is a sculpture by an artist named Polyclitus. It's called the Doriferous, which just means the spear bearer he would have originally so this is a uh, greek statue uh 450 to 440 bce so about 2500 years old well the spear but the reason we're looking at it is it's just this amazing representation of the human body in a position that we call contrapposto it's incredibly naturalistic or realistic naturalism is a word that art historians use all the time to talk about the way that something looks close to nature similar to what we see in the world around us and in this so he looks like a natural person now it is stylized in the sense that most people don't look like this right um case we're looking at the proportions the understanding of the contours of the body of the muscles of the body and understanding of the bones under the flesh and how the body moves in space and how it distributes weight as it moves and how that weight shifts as the body moves this is a complicated understanding of the body that gets translated into this marble sculpture that looks so lifelike we almost expect it to move and talk to us now clearly this was made by somebody who cared a lot about what the human body looked like, about the mechanics of the human body. This is based on careful, direct observation. And so here we have not only an artist, but a culture that cared about science, that cared about human potential. And so those are good ways to describe the culture of ancient Greece and Rome. So let's fast forward more than 1500 years to the town of Chartres, just south of Paris. So here we have on the left, we have the classical period. In the middle, we have the Renaissance, uh, the, sorry, the medieval. And they're going to talk about some statues right now. ...to a huge cathedral, and on the front of that cathedral are some very highly stylized figures that we call jam figures. These are attached to architecture, so immediately we notice a significant change from the Doriferous. The Doriferous, the spear bearer, was freestanding. In other words, we could walk around him. And that's important because when the sculptor thought about rendering him, he thought about what it would look like from all points of view. But when you're sculpting something that's attached to the architecture, in this case to columns, the medieval sculpture because here we are in the Middle Ages. The sculptor thought about making the figures match the columns behind. So the figures are tall and elongated like the columns behind them. When we look at the Doriferous, we get a sense of a man who's really walking. Here, we look at figures that are not really in our world. They are high above us. They are otherworldly, and they're not looking at us. They're not noticing things around them. They are symbols of the human body. We can say that they're transcendent, that they transcend earthly existence. After the fall of the Roman Empire, what happens in Western Europe is the ascendance of Christianity. The human body was less important than the spiritual sense, and so 
Christian art often in the medieval period focused on ways of abstracting the body to create a symbol of the spirit, which of course by definition has no form. And so it's not a surprise that Christian artists then turn to this kind of abstracted rendering. So what do we mean? So again, during the classical period, value human body, human uh, that looks realistic here. No, it's the message, right? by abstracted. Well, first of all, the figures are tall and elongated like columns. They don't resemble a body so much as a columnar shape. You could also notice that when we look at the drapery, the clothing that covers the figures, we don't have much of a sense of the body underneath the drapery. Instead, there's a real focus on pattern, and you see that in the drapery. You also see it in the platforms directly below the figures. So there's this equating, perhaps, of decorative beauty with the spiritual. Those decorative forms we can see in the beautiful wavy lines at the bottoms of their drapery. We could also say that these figures lack a sense of weight. One of the things about being a human being is that we have bodies, we move through space, and we have weight to us. And we sense that when we look at the Doriferous. He stands firmly on the ground, he moves through space, but these figures have feet that point slightly down. There's no way they could really stand in this way. And so they have a sense of weightlessness that I think matches their abstract, transcendent qualities. Well, also just look at the proportions of the bodies. Look at the length of their legs compared to the length of their torsos or their heads. There's nothing naturalistic about this. They are so elongated. But are these less beautiful? Are they less well done than the Doriferous? They're just different. The goals were different. It's not that the artist is less skilled or somehow wanted to make the Doriferous but ended up making these figures on the outside of Chart Cathedral. These were an expression of the deep faith of the people of the Middle Ages. And so the Doriferous and the figures at Chart are both spectacular, but they are both responding to very different cultural needs. We can see that again when we move to the Renaissance. Now we're looking about 200 years or so later at a sculpture by the great Italian Renaissance sculptor Donatello. So this one is made in bronze, so it's a type of metal. The other one by Michelangelo is marble. And here we are in the early Renaissance in Florence. And boy, do we see how the artists of the Renaissance are looking back, not to the figures on the cathedral from the Middle Ages, but rather to ancient Greek and Roman art like the Doriferous. Note that Donatello has stripped off virtually every stitch of clothing, <laughs> just like the Doriferous. This is not a rendering that is concerned with the patterning of drapery. This is about the mechanics and the beauty of the human body. Very much like the Doriferous. Now, we should say that Donatello is not specifically looking back at the sculptures of Chart and rejecting them. He's rejecting the ways that the artists of the Middle Ages approached the human body. And in doing so, Donatello is really embodying the idea of the Renaissance. Renaissance is a French word, which means rebirth, and it refers to a renewed interest in classical humanism, in this case, the rendering of, of the human body. And a big part of the humanism of the Renaissance is also just an interest in the secular world, an interest in the natural world. And art, once again, becomes based on observation of the visual world. So the story is complicated. In the Renaissance, we have a return to an earlier kind of naturalism. And it gets even more complicated when you move into the modern world, where artists can choose between naturalism and abstraction or any variant in between. And a great example of that is the 20th century artist Giacometti. Giacometti had at his disposal a world. So we'll stop there for that one. Um, one thing that I wanted to go over with you guys was some of these vocabulary uh, that I didn't go over. So if something is in relief, that means that it's attached to something, right? For example, these statues are in relief. These statues, this one, these guys, they're in relief. That means that they're attached to something. They're not freestanding, okay? In relief. The next word was um, in nude. Nude simply means something with no clothes. For example, this is a nude, these, these, the one on the left. And the one on the right are nudes. This is a nude. And this is a nude. Okay. Um, Michelangelo is probably the greatest sculpture in history. Uh, he's also a painter, and we're going to focus on some of his works. He painted the David, which you focus on today, the Moses and the Pieta. You will need to be able to identify those. Okay, Michelangelo, this is the, the David, Michelangelo's David. 
Michelangelo's Pieta and Michelangelo's Moses. Okay. And the, la uh, the two last ones, anatomy is a stu study of the human body, right? Being able to understand the movement of bones, the movement of muscles, uh, how the body functions. And freestanding is, literally means freestanding. This is a freestanding. The one on the left and the right are freestanding. This one's not standing at all. This is freestanding. Okay. So to summarize, classical, value human body. A lot of the statues were of gods, human beauty, focus on realism uh, and naturalism. Middle Ages, focus on religion, clothing, not realistic, very realistic, because the mess it, that wasn't the point, right? And the Renaissance, uh, value body, religion, still value religion. Religion is really important in the Renaissance. Uh, value realism and the natural world, science and anatomy. I know this video is kind of long and I apologize. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.